On May 4th, 1886, workers were peacefully protesting outside a factory in Chicago at Haymarket Square when police arrived in mass to shut it down. And then out of the darkness and explosion, a bomb was thrown that killed several officers and injured many more. Police fired back and chaos ensued. This riot shook the entire international workers movement and led to greater challenges for workers trying to secure basic rights across America. But what led those workers to gather that day and for someone to toss a bomb. Well, that's the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer and this is History for Humans. All right, guys, we're going to jump right into it today. And our exploration for today's story lecture is what caused workers to protest at Haymarket Square and what impact did the riot have on the fight for workers' rights in America? So keep your mind focused on that question as we go through the story. But first, shovels out, because we got some history to dig up. So remember from our last episode, after the Civil War, America was in the Gilded Age and was rapidly industrializing. The switch to the industrial economy caused more changes in 50 years than it probably had in the previous few thousand years of human history. And with great change follows great conflict. One of the main changes was the working conditions for men and women. Remember, before industrialization, most people were farmers or skilled artisans who had pride in their work and were often essential parts of their communities. They were mostly independent and worked according to their own rules. And though they surely worked hard and many still struggled to make ends meet, industrialization would demean and belittle these workers in almost every important way. With the rise of machines and factories, skilled labor, and this is important, was replaced by unskilled labor. Being unskilled meant that these workers could be poorly paid, poorly treated, and easily replaced because at the same time, there was a flood of immigrants arriving in America looking for work. And that's the focus of our next story, so make sure to check that out. Industrialization led to workers doing the same monotonous tasks over and over again as things like the assembly line were perfected. This monotony, the sheer drudgery of work, might have been the worst part for these workers. If you've ever watched the classic Wizard of Oz, the Tin Man represented the industrial worker. And what was he missing? A heart, symbolizing that he became a soulless machine himself, not even human. On top of the drudgery, other problems included that it was incredibly unsafe. Work injuries and even death was common. America led the world with industrial work fatalities, with about 35,000 workers dying on the job each year. Worker pay was incredibly low and the hours were incredibly long. Many worked between 60 and 80 hours a week and still just barely got by. Widespread poverty also led to the rampant use of child labor across the country. And it was these factors that led the workers to gather that night at Haymarket Square. Although the so-called riot took place on May 4th, the protest really began on May 1st, May Day. It was part of a national protest and strike by tens of thousands of workers demanding, most importantly, an eight-hour workday. A strike was simply when workers refused to work, hoping to cost the managers and owners enough lost profits that they would sit down and negotiate with the workers and give in to some of their demands. So workers from all different industries participated. Railroad workers, miners, textile and Pullman workers, and in Chicago, close to Haymarket Square, workers at the McCormick Reaper Works that produced farm equipment were there protesting as well. It began with a massive parade and it had a festive atmosphere, but the factory owners continued to ignore their demands and did their best to break the strike. They attempted to hire strike breakers or so-called scabs to replace the striking workers outside. Eventually, violence broke out. The police fired on and killed a worker and several others were injured. A mass meeting was then called on the night of the 4th to protest the police shooting and continue the fight for workers' rights, something that unions across the country had been attempting for decades. Now, a union is simply a collection of workers who come together to push for better working conditions. 
With rapid industrialization and worsening work conditions, the need for unions increased at this time, but were still considered illegal and not recognized by the law or business owners. The Knights of Labor began in 1869. Unlike other unions, they tried to include all wage earners. They allowed in skilled and unskilled, male and female, and even African Americans. They were much more radical than other unions and went beyond simply demanding better working conditions but wanted to reform the whole capitalist and political system in America. They wanted limits on immigration to stop them from competing with American workers and restrictions on child labor as well. By 1886, they grew to have 750,000 members but were still not legally recognized. Then there was the American Federation of Labor, a union that's still around today. The AFL differed greatly from the Knights of Labor. Led by Samuel Gompers, a Jewish immigrant to America who worked from a young age with his father making cigars, and he later led a cigar makers union. Gompers' AFL embraced American capitalism and did not advocate for a radical change. Instead, they simply wanted more. More pay, more benefits, and more safety protections and shorter hours. They also let in less people. The AFL only let in skilled workers, but they brought together carpenters, masons, hat makers, bricklayers, and even cigar makers into one big union with over 500,000 members. And that brings us to Dad Jokes in History. Why did the unskilled railroad workers try to join the Knights of Labor? Why? Because the AFL said they weren't properly trained. Trained. Wow. And we're back. Another famous labor hero was Mary Mother Jones. Mother Jones organized for the Knights of Labor and was considered the most dangerous woman in America and was later called the grandmother of all alligators on the floors of the Senate, a title that I hope she held in pride. Losing her husband and four children to yellow fever and having her dress shop destroyed by the Great Chicago Fire, she became a fearless defender of poor workers and led many strikes and campaigns to secure dignity to workers and eventually helped to found an even more radical union, the Industrialized Workers of the World. Looking at some of the stark photographs of workers from the time, if you try to put yourself into their shoes or for some bare feet, you can probably imagine why so many of them wanted to form unions as a means to fight for better working conditions. And maybe even why some of them called for drastic changes, because some of those radicals had gathered to protest on May 4th in Haymarket Square in a call for revenge, and someone was assembling dynamite for the occasion. Following the killing of the worker at the McCormick factory, workers held a second mass meeting on the 4th. There were songs and speeches at the rally and a couple thousand people in attendance. The atmosphere was tense and many of the higher-ups feared violence. Even the mayor had attended to keep an eye on things but headed home early, satisfied with the peaceful showing. When the last speaker, Samuel Fielden, an anarchist, began to speak though, the weather darkened. The rain fell harder and harder and some began to leave. He was concluding his speech when a police squad marched towards the protesters. Sent in because of Fielden's supposedly inflammatory remarks, they ordered him to stop speaking and for the crowd to disperse. That's when someone in the darkness with a homemade bomb ignited the fuse and threw it towards the officers. The fuse sputtered, jaws dropped, and then it exploded. Seven police officers died and dozens of others were injured. Violence erupted in the chaos, gunfire in all directions as the police shot into the crowd and shots were fired back. Four more were killed and more than 70 wounded. In five minutes, the square was empty except the fallen. But who had thrown the bomb, killed these officers, and was responsible for the bloodshed? No one knew, but intense public outrage and the whole might of the Chicago police force were going to make someone pay for it and get some revenge of their own. The murder of the police and the resulting chaos turned public opinion, the press, and the government against not just those preaching violence, but anyone holding radical beliefs that preached revolution, including the Knights of Labor. Eventually, eight anarchists were put on trial for the murder of the police, and the judge and jury were obviously biased against them and cared not for providing a fair trial. Samuel Fielden, the speaker, was one of those on trial, and he was one of several immigrants, all of whom were anarchists. 
Several of them were not even at the rally when the bomb exploded, and no real evidence was presented to really show that they were responsible. But they were all found guilty by the hostile judge and jury for what came down to holding un-American beliefs. Seven of the eight were sentenced to hang for the supposed crimes. When the first four were sent to the gallows, they walked with white robes and sang Marseille, which was the anarchist anthem. One shouted just before the floor dropped, the time will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangled today. And they hung. The others were eventually pardoned when a new governor sought to restore some semblance of justice to the affair. Almost immediately after, a statue went up to honor the policemen who were killed at the site in Haymarket Square. But years later, as more Americans reconsidered the event and the fight for workers' rights and the injustice of the trial, a new monument was put up at the cemetery where the anarchists were buried to honor what they had been fighting for. And aside from the four who were executed, the Knights of Labor also met its ultimate demise due to the Haymarket riot. Falsely seen as responsible and equally guilty, the union fell apart. However, the AFL and many other smaller unions continued the fight for workers' rights in the eight-hour day without the Knights. Over the course of many decades, the labor movement eventually helped to secure so many things that we take for granted today. The 40-hour work week, worker protection laws, an end to child labor, a two-day weekend, and of course, Labor Day. So remember, when you're celebrating that day, it's not just about barbecues and a break from school or work, because in that way, we honor their struggles and their trials triumphs and hopefully find some gratitude for the history that they left us and a responsibility to uphold it. So thanks for engaging in some history today. This has been History for Humans. Hey, thanks so much for watching the episode. I really appreciate it. And it would really mean a lot to me if you just took one second and clicked the thumb. It looks like this right down there. And you can hit the subscribe button. That would be awesome too. For teachers and homeschool parents, I have resources and lesson plans that go with all of my episodes on my website, historyforhumans.com. And you can save yourself a lot of time, stress, and energy and just enjoy exploring history with your students. If you're doing the learning activity that's found on my website, hang out for just a second because we got instructions coming up next. All right, guys, we got an interesting lesson for you today. The main idea of this lesson is, of course, on workers' rights and the Haymarket riot, but you're going to be developing a new skill and thinking about bias. Bias is when information is opinionated or coming from a certain point of view that could distort it. Because you got to remember, when studying history, most primary and even secondary sources are biased in some way. It could be supportive of workers, against unions, in favor of immigrant rights, or supportive of workers, but critical of the Knights of Labor. So you're going to be looking at several primary sources and you're going to have to identify if you think the source is supportive or critical of the workers protesting at Haymarket Square or determine if you think it's neutral. And if so, you have to explain with evidence from the image or the short text to support your answer. Then you're going to come up with three different headlines that could have appeared the day after the riots. One of them is going to be supportive. One is going to be critical and the last one's going to be neutral. And this should get you to better recognize when the media that you're consuming on your phone or TV or the two of you who still read the newspaper is trying to influence you or just inform you. And that's a vital responsibility for being a citizen. All right, act like geologists on this one and rock it.